Some games just age better than others. Fifth Fleet from the gaming and strategy juggernaut Avalon Hill is a great example of this. This game is 17 years old, but when it was released it didn't need flashy graphics, and so it still holds up really well today. The game is based on an alternative modern history, with a war between the US and its allies and the Russian and its allies in the Indian Ocean. This one setting does make the game a little bit limited, but there are enough missions and options here to keep you involved for a long, long time. Although task groups start off quite small with just a few ships and submarines and planes, this can escalate to missions which are full-on wars. The controls are quite simple once you get used to them, letting you really focus on the strategy that's involved. Really, any wargamer that's into realistic, if alternative history games should take a look at this title. Seven Cities of Gold is a game about going in and subjugating indigenous peoples, which I think is something that we can all agree is a good idea. You play as a Spanish conquistador going to the New World to basically cheat, rob or kill your way to as large a fortune as you can manage. You start by loading up with men, horses, goods, priests, anything that you might need, and then find your way to the New World, which can either be the real world or it can be a randomly generated map. You then have to get as much as you can by either trading nicely with the natives for a few beads for all of their gold and priceless artifacts, or simply going in with your soldiers and kicking ass until you can take as much as you want for free. It may remind some gamers a little bit of Oregon Trail with its managing of people and resources, but it's a lot more fun and the exploration aspect really adds a lot to the experience. Seven Colors is a good kind of puzzle game in that it's based on a very simple premise. It's a two-player game, but you can play against the computer. You start in the bottom left of the gaming environment, and your opponent starts in the top right. You then take turns changing the color of your pieces. Any pieces that are the same color become attached to your mass until you get a larger and larger mass growing from your corner of the screen. Also, if you can completely circle any groups of diamonds, then you take those pieces as well. You take turns going backwards and forwards until one of you is holding more than half of the game board, which means that you've won. The game can be made more complex with black diamonds which neither side can take, which act as kind of barriers. But to be honest, this game does get a little old pretty quickly. There's probably about 30 or 40 minutes of good play here though. Nine Poker. I'll tell you one thing about this game. It ain't poker. It's some kind of card game, but I don't know what the hell it is. You start off with four players playing around in a circle. If you have a seven of any suit, then you can open that suit. Players then take it in turns putting down cards. If you have a card that's one higher or one lower than anything that's showing, then you can place the card. For example, if there's a ten of hearts open, then you can put the jack of hearts on it. If you have no cards, then you have to put one card face down. This does act as a penalty against your score, but it can also be used to block your opponents from putting down other cards as well. And because this is a Japanese gambling game, there are of course screens of scantily clad anime babes. Don't worry though, there's not too much nudity, until the later levels where they're password protected so your kids will never have to look at things like this raunch. Tenth Frame Bowling does exactly what it says. It's a bowling game. As you can see, the graphics are pretty rudimentary, pretty straightforward. You can play with teams, and you can have up to four players on each team. Apart from that, it's just bowling, bowling, bowling. You start off by moving your player left or right. You can then also move your aim left or right down the alleyway. You then go into a three-click process, which some gamers might find similar to some of the older golf games out there. You click once to start your meter going up. You stop it to set your speed, which you always want to be quite high. And then you click a third time to add spin or hook to your shot, if you like, or you can try to bowl straight. Apart from that, there's not much to say about this game. It does what it does fairly well, but you're not going to get hours and hours of enjoyment out of this one. Not unless you're really, 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 really into bowling.
When I was about six or seven years old, I had a plastic sliding puzzle. And at that age, I worked out the system that you can use to solve it. Once you know how to do one of these things, you can do all of them. I've always been happy that I picked up this skill pretty early on, because it seems like pretty much every adventure game you ever play has one of these damn sliding puzzles in it. But really, if you can do one, you can do any of them. And that's all that this game is. Sliding puzzles. I'm not sure why it's called 15 by 15 puzzles, because they're either 3 by 3 or 4 by 4 The pictures that you end up making do create a small story about a guy whose dog chases a cat, and yes, it's about as exciting as that sounds. So you either know how to do these puzzles or you don't. If you do, then this game is going to offer you no challenge at all. If you don't and you want to practice them, well, then here's your game. Two Twenty One Baker Street is actually a board game that had been converted to a computer game. Four players can play at once. You play the game by rolling a dice and then moving your pieces around a board. In that way, it's a little bit like Clue. As you go into buildings, you can get clues on the current case that you're trying to solve. These can either be in plain English or you can have them coded and jumbled up if you'd prefer an extra challenge. Basically, once you have enough clues and you think you know who did it, you go and get a badge from the police station, return to Sherlock Holmes' house, and then solve the mystery. You need to choose the killer, the motive, and the weapon. If you get them right, then it tells you. You can also play by yourself, but for some reason the game still makes you roll dice, which just slows everything down. This is a good idea for a game, but you imagine it would be much more fun actually playing it on a board. But still, if you're into mysteries, and particularly if you have someone to play with, you might get some fun out of this one. 688 Attack Sub is a pretty good submarine simulation game. In that, it really punishes you if you just want to go in and blow things up. As in real submarine tactics, this game really rewards stealthy and strategic play. Going at things head-on will always, always, always result in you getting blown up, which I guess is a good thing. There are a number of missions to choose from, which usually involve anything from blowing up a number of targets to escaping from an area undetected. After that, there's a lot of looking at maps and various battle stations. Again, you're not going to see a lot of explosions or a lot of action in this. Slow, thoughtful action is the name of the game. If you get too impatient or you try to rush in, you'll pretty much always get destroyed. But if you hold back, think about what you're doing and make a plan, then you'll usually be rewarded. So again, a good game for fans of this genre. 1000 Miglia. Well, I guess Miglia is Italian for kilometers or something. This is a long-range racing game based in the late 20s and early 30s. What were cars like back then? Well, they were chunks of shit. And in this respect, this game is pretty accurate, because all of these cars drive like refrigerators on ice. I like what this game's trying to do. It's trying to involve some tactics in long-range driving, and that it gives you some parts to choose from to make repairs and so on. You need to take care of your car in order to go the distance. It gives you some different weather conditions to drive through. Unfortunately, where it falls down is the game itself. As you can see, the driving is pretty boring and terrible. It just spawns cars and throws them at you. It doesn't matter if you're in first place or last place, you'll get the same number of cars bouncing off your front bumper. Also, making repairs is purely random, so there's no actual tactics to choosing your parts. It's just a guessing game. Again, I like what the game's trying to do, it just doesn't do it very well. Speaking of board games and Avalon Hill, 1830 is a converted board game made by Avalon Hill. For this game, you really need to read the manual, because it's not at all obvious. It's not a pick-up-and-play game. You start off by picking an industrialist with really cool facial hair, and then you go into a round of stock market bidding and train building and planning. It goes backwards and forwards between the two phases until someone's completely bankrupt, in which case the richest player at the time wins. Like I said, this game is a bit messy to start off with, but once you understand what's going on, you'll find a very deep, very involved, and very tricky strategy game here. The AI is very competent, even on the easiest levels, so you'll probably get your ass kicked a lot. Like I said, this is a complicated game. It may seem a little dry with the stock market trading and so on, but it really is worth the effort of figuring out how to play.